This is a 20 minute VHS tape about a Lego character called Jack Stone. When it came out in 2001, it was the first real computer animated Lego movie, but it hasn't aged that well. Incredible, fantastic. 13 years later, the Lego movie looked like this. Let's watch that again. This is 2001. There you have it. And this is 2014. Yes, that's me. That is a huge difference. Here's how they made it happen. My name is uh, Grant Freckleton. I'm a production designer at Animal Logic. He's overseen the animation style of movies like Legend of the Guardians 300 and more recently the Lego movie with co-directors Chris Miller and Phil Lord. Chris and Phil were determined to sort of make sure the audience were confused about what they were seeing. You know, is this actually stop motion or is this a CG film? And that became a big debate. Before the movie came out, there was a lot of conversation about whether the movie was stop motion or computer animation. It is. I would say 99% uh, CG animation, but it respects the rules of stop motion animation as designed to emulate that style. To understand what made that style so unique, you have to look back at what Lego movies used to look like. Early productions for themes like Bionicle, Star Wars, and Batman helped establish the whimsical feel of Lego movies, but the animation didn't fit the physics of the toy itself. There was this tendency to sort of treat the plastic as if it was kind of flexible rubber, um, which mean, meant the characters could flex and move a lot more than they might be able to in real life. That style is typical of more traditional computer animation, like what you'd expect to see in a Pixar movie. Take a shot like this, for example. The background isn't made of actual blocks, plastic limbs are bending in ways that they couldn't, and the faces are a bizarre blend of skin-like texture and Lego geometry. It doesn't look like a scene you could make at home with your own Legos. Compare that to scenes from the Lego movie, where everything, gunshots, smoke, water, fire, explosions, clouds, even mud on the camera, are all made up of Lego pieces as they look in real life. We respected the, the hardness of the plastic by sort of um, not necessarily bending on the elbow, which you can't do on a real Lego minifig. That means that any movement you see on screen simulates the adjustment or replacement of an individual Lego piece. A joint or facial expression will never actually bend or stretch. It'll either move slightly or be replaced by another piece. Early Lego movies lacked that level of discipline. They struggled because they fought back against the limitations of the medium instead of embracing them. But the creators of the Lego movie saw things differently. Characters that have you know, limitations force you to find um, solutions and charming ways of doing things in different ways. I mean, you know, look at R2-D2. He's like the ultimate limited character. He's basically a bin with wheels that makes beeping noises and that's all he's got to work with. Um, yet he's a really charming character and everybody loves him. Same with BB-8 and, and, and other characters. Same with the Muppets. You know, they're essentially sock puppets with googly eyes that you don't really have much control over. But it's from those limitations you actually get a lot of charm. Every now and then the Lego movie animators would let some joints overextend slightly to make room for a nod or a shrug of the shoulders, but overall, sticking to the plastic rule made for a believable movie. You can freeze frame any part of the Lego movie and look at a scene that you could practically make at home. We're always trying to sort of echo and, and, and hark back to um, you know, how a child might make a film in this, so we would alternate between you know, thinking like um, responsible filmmakers working on a large um, budget Warner Brothers animated film, and then we would suddenly approach a scene as if we were like a kid animating in their basement. But the history of Lego movies actually does start with kids animating in their basements. In 1973, two Danish cousins aged 10 and 12 shot a short film called Journey to the Moon on Super 8 film. They made it for their grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, and it's widely considered to be the first time anyone made a motion picture with Lego blocks. Note that the people in this film are just little cylinder blocks. This was before any version of the minifigure design came out. Movies like this came to be known as brick films. When fans were making these at home, they shot them in traditional stop motion. Footage was usually shot on twos, which meant that they would take 12 pictures, adjusting the characters every other frame, to make one second of film. Shooting on ones meant taking 24 pictures per second. This was usually reserved for making faster movements, like running, look smoother. 
When the Danish cousins sent their movie to the managing director of the Lego group, they were rewarded with a tour of the Lego factory and sent home with large Lego sets. But Lego hasn't always had the most positive reaction to homemade fan films like this one. Between 1985 and 1989, a teenage animator named Lindsay Flay worked on a 16-minute short called The Magic Portal. He used borrowed equipment to shoot it in his parents' basement. Before entering festivals and competitions, Flay sent the film to LEGO to see if they were interested in doing something with it. At first, LEGO responded with a letter of approval. But soon, the company started expressing legal concerns and issued a letter demanding Flay surrender all copies of the film within seven days. LEGO ultimately backed down, but Flay had already missed out on most major film festivals by then. Flay actually went on to work at Animal Logic. He left before production on LEGO projects began, but his movie had a huge influence on the world of brick films. If you look at the live action portion of the, of the Lego movie, you'll see Finn, the little kid, holds up a uh, sort of cardboard tube and across the side is written, um, Magic Portal. The Lego movie, of course, was a huge technical feat. There are 15,080,330 animated Lego pieces and 182 unique minifigures in the movie. Early mock-ups of buildings and vehicles were drafted out on a free software called Lego Digital Designer. Later on, in the animation software Maya, each brick was given profiles for fingerprints, dents, seam lines, scratches, and dust. It's hard to imagine what the Lego movie would be if it weren't for the legacy of these early home experiments. Where most animated films use soft lighting modeled after paintings, the Lego movie's lighting was harsh, replicating the actual lamps that animators like Flay used. Playful, non-stop motion interludes, like levitation via fishing line, were part of Journey to the Moon long before they appeared in the Lego movie. Even the final break from the Lego world into the real world to meet a human creator parallels the magic portal really closely. It's easy to miss on screen, but the Lego movie pays tribute to fan films in the background of this scene. These four clips are shorts submitted by fans. Look at all of these things that people built. The homage was a nod to the fans. By doing that, the movie embraced the idea that amateur creators matter. And sometimes the way they handle source material is far better than the way major studios are used to doing it. If you want to try any of this at home, you can actually use the same software that the animators of the LEGO movie used. It's called LEGO Digital Designer. It's totally free off the internet. When I talked to Grant Freckleton, he challenged me to make this uh, sort of pig-drawn carriage. I tried. Uh, I got the pigs, and I got the wheels, uh, but not much else. It's very, very difficult. 